This is a Digital Music Trends episode 156 on the 30th of October 2013. Coming up on the show, YouTube may be close to launching its music subscription service, Google backs a new music venture by LeoCoin, SoundCloud reaches a quarter billion monthly uniques, SFX continues its acquisition spree, Troy Carter sets up a startup fund, Ontario's $45 million music fund and much more. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, a Halloween edition, and if you're listening to the audio version of the show, you will have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, but uh, I'm Andrea Lianelli and this is a weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And the DMT is available as audio, video, on a variety of channels, including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. To get in touch with the show, you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends. And uh, this week, it's a real pleasure to welcome these guys that are sporting uh, interesting uh, uh, contraptions on the cameras and so uh, <laughs> first up i'm not sure what bench has got in his hands but Wait, first up <laughs> first up it's uh, i'm gonna take this off because it's uh, really hot in here uh, but yeah uh, first up is benji rogers uh, first time on the show it's a real pleasure to welcome you on uh, the ceo of pledge music and uh, if you don't know what pledge music is uh, just pause the show for a second and head on to pledgemusic.com and uh, go and check out what they do so hi benji and great to have you on how's it going Good morning. Very well, thank you. It's great to have you. And uh, as we were saying, it's uh, uh, always early morning meetings for us. It's uh, 9 a.m. for you in New York. So thanks for uh, joining us. I'll get you back. (laughs) <laughs> and joining us uh, once again on the show today is uh, Darren Hemmings, uh, who runs the uh, digital marketing consultancy Motive Unknown, as well as sending out daily mail outs uh, with the best news in the music and tech space. Uh, that's called the Daily Digest, and you can also sign up for it by visiting motiveunknown.com. So, hey, Darren, how's it going? Good, thank you. Good to be here. It's great to be here. And so uh, this week, we're going to start by talking about uh, YouTube music uh, because, uh, you know, once again, we're all abuzz with the rumors and uh, uh, voices and uh, all sorts of things uh, happening around that. So the news was broken by Alex Pham, who's a a pretty, you know, he's a respected journalist, so I'm I'm sure his sources are are good, uh, quoting uh, sources familiar to the plans. And apparently YouTube is uh, very, very close to rolling out uh, its uh, new subscription music service, uh, which will have uh, apparently both a free and a paid Tier. So uh, the free tier, of course, uh, unlimited but ad supported potentially uh, in line with uh, YouTube's current market strategy with uh, on the video side. And uh, on the paid tier, it's a really a big question, a big fat question mark because we have no idea as to how it's going to work, whether it's going to have any integration with uh, the Google Play um, store and, and subscription service and, and how all that is going to roll out. So uh, first of all, you know, do you think that YouTube is gunning for Spotify? as uh, uh, this new subscription service rolls out uh, or is it going to look for a slightly different demographic? Uh, Darren, what are your thoughts on this? Um, I don't know that it's, I mean, it's probably, you could argue it's already gunning for Spotify if you wanted to by way of having the all access streaming service, which probably bears a a slightly closer resemblance. Um, I mean, I think it's certainly an interesting move on their part, but I have to say for me, it's, it's, it's a funny one. I mean, there's a lot of these streaming services popping up now, but the YouTube one seems to raise more questions Right. For me, anyway, because, um, you know, it is perceived by artists generally in, in sort of anecdotally from my side of, of you know, working with, with bands and campaigns as, as being sort of a, you know, a video platform. And therefore, right. you know, it's, yeah, it's it's a funny one. I sort of find myself wondering how it will hang together because there's, you know, there's talk that maybe, well, I mean, almost certainly YouTube will uh, push a whole load of the album tracks for your bands to, you know, up onto YouTube with a static image of some sort and, yeah. you know, and all of that. But, yeah, it's it's a video platform. And a lot of bands, I know, rightly or wrongly, kind of see it as a, you know, as a, as a place where their singles go up for their videos, which is why, you know, it's been interesting in the big sort of Spotify streaming services debate that, that YouTube hasn't really had a, a, you know, it hasn't played a, a huge part in that. No one's massively mentioned it apart from a few journalists asking why it's not really featuring in the discussion right. um so if, if that's the case i just kind of wonder what the response to that will be because i would imagine there's probably quite a few bands that wouldn't be that receptive to suddenly having all of their stuff uploaded as a static pack shot and, and things like that but yeah. you know it's interesting at a time when everyone's talking about you know the need for streaming services to maybe empower artists more to kind of upsell different things around you know their offering and, and whatever else it, you know on paper at least youtube in its current state does actually do that yeah. more so than anyone else you know for if i've got a youtube channel and i'm part of youtube uh you know i can have you know custom merch annotations to drive people to various 
retailers, be they iTunes or whomever, or, you know, yeah, your kind of top spins or, or whatever you like, you know. Yeah, sure. Um, and so it does empower people uh, probably more than Spotify does in that respect. But um, whether they're gunning for Spotify, I don't know. I think YouTube probably, uh, you know, and Google don't, don't really figure Spotify in their general things. You know, if you, if you consider their sort of turnover, they could swallow Spotify whole with considerable indifference, I yes, would imagine. absolutely. And, uh, and Benji, uh, looking at, uh, we were talking about, um, you know, Google is a company that is known for being quite disruptive in, in what it does, uh, you know, brings innovation into the fields that it moves into. In the case of music, it hasn't been it hasn't been so. You know, if you look at the Google Play Music All Access service, it's a pretty straightforward music subscription service. The price point is the same as the others, and there is no subs, you know substantial differences really between uh, uh, Google's offering and, and those of another uh, five ten companies around the world. So, uh, do you think that the YouTube service might bring that element of disruption to uh, uh, this arena also on the pricing side uh, you know I, I think that the the, the chance to, to disrupt the streaming space is kind of over and right. I think that if anything YouTube's probably doing the one thing that Apple hasn't done which is create that on-demand streaming service um, you know I, I think iTunes match and radio are sort of the way forward and that would be the one thing that YouTube could kind of pull out first and, and sort of say hey look we're gonna do this one thing that Apple hasn't done as far as Spotify you know um, I, I'm you know, the one thing I'd be excited for about, about YouTube streaming service is if they did pull in the annotations in the same way that you were mentioning, Darren. That, that's, that's a game changer for me. Um, you know, uh, we, got, we got whitelisted for YouTube annotations a while back, and it does make a big difference. It really, you definitely do see it. And then you're able to use, use YouTube in, in the way that it's meant to. You know, a while back I was asked this question. If you could change anything about the music industry, just wave a magic wand and change it, what would it be? And the answer was is that you would be able to share what you're doing in real time via, you know, for me it was pledge campaigns, but like be able to share in real time access to monetization points through streaming. Right. Because ultimately if you're listening, one of the feedback that we get from our artists and we talk to them is, I love having my music all over the place. The problem is people who are listening to it don't know what I'm doing today. And the larger the streaming services get, the more power they have over it. And if you think about what the labels did for years, they gave all their power to iTunes, all their power to Amazon, all their power to the, to the high street, and all their customer data. So now, if a new, new YouTube service launches, they're gonna give all their power over to YouTube. YouTube will control that gateway to the fans. So I think that, that if they allow the annotations and get smart about it, they could actually make it very cool. Because the headline should read, YouTube helps independent and emerging artists reach their fans in a better way. Right. So it's not just about the dissemination of a Spotify and RDO and Napster, you know, the thousands of them there are. It's about the, um, the engagement point. Because if you're listening to something that, I mean, one of the things to remember too, if you're listening to something on a streaming service, it happened already. That's the past. The future is real time. The future is social networking. And so the, the, the second you get a video up on YouTube, it's that moment of like, it's actually happening right there and then. And then you can, you know, the possibilities, of course, for live streaming are huge. So I don't know that they're going for Spotify. I think everyone's going for each other. And I would not want to be starting a streaming service right now. <laughs> of course. But, uh, but YouTube does have the edge in that it has, you know, you know, billions of tracks. The other thing I'd say on that too that's interesting is YouTube already isn't um, able to properly monetize for artists because most artists don't have access to their own publishing streams uh, through it. And I think that they're going to have to radically expand that partners program to get the artists their money because it's being collected. It's just not being paid out. Right. And that's not the fault of YouTube. I don't think it's the fault of, you know, well, it's... We do like Jeff Price or Audium are trying to change that with, you know, getting money for people. But that would be a, a huge thing. I know just from looking in the back of YouTube's um, platform, yeah. you know, uh, I was able to find 17 million streams for one song that was owned by a friend of mine, none of which had been monetized, some of which had been pushed towards somebody else. So there's a huge amount of that. And the bigger they get, the more of that, that will be there. Luckily, they are paying it out if you can identify it. So, you know. Right. Absolutely. And uh, another side of the story that is interesting for me is the fact that uh, Google, of course, is the largest uh, online advertiser in the world. And so if we look at the uh, free uh, sort of uh, ad based uh, side of the business, that could make for quite an interesting granular uh, potential to address music fans that hasn't been 
uh, available for services like Spotify and uh, in its freemium uh, mode and also other uh, large streaming companies. I'm thinking of Pandora, for example. It's, uh, you know, you have to go through channels to get your advertising on those platforms uh, and you have to spend a considerable amount of money. It'd be quite interesting to see if uh, uh, YouTube uh, allowed you to uh, target advertising to users of the music subscription services and, and what that means as well for, for some, somebody like you, Darren, as well, who does a lot of online marketing. Yeah, I mean, it's certainly um, the whole remarketing side of, of YouTube where you can capture people that have viewed your video or, you know, visited your website or whatever is far and away the sort of most effective way of, of advertising by way of, you know, it being the cheapest and generally bringing in the best kind of conversion rates. So, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think it is, it's, it's the thing people are sort of missing in, in all of this is like, you know, the fact that YouTube at the moment actually offers a, well, it's a hell of a lot. I mean, there's probably more it could do, but it offers a lot more than any other streaming service by way of empowerment towards, you know, the artists taking part on it. So, yeah, from that perspective, it could be really exciting because God knows, you know, if there was ways I could reach people that have uh, played my music on Spotify or, you know, even tagged my track on Shazam and things like that, you know, that would be a great way of just trying to connect with those people. And, you know, I think the nice thing with, with that sort of route to advertising is that it's very direct and very clear, which when you look at sort of social media platforms, particularly Facebook, where, you know, ads are, are kind of littered with uh, false points of engagement where someone can sort of click like or share or this or that, when really all you want them to do is click and, and you know, take your call to action, be it a, a buy link or a link back to your website or whatever. Um, you know, th there's many means by which people can sort of stumble along the way and not hit the exact point of engagement you're after. So, when you can run just very direct ads going, here's the new video or whatever you want, and people can just click, and there's one thing you can do, click on the ad and go wherever you've specified, then, um, then that's, that's very effective and very useful. So, yeah, it would be very good to see what they offer up and how this all hangs together, you know, yeah. relative to the premium offering. And, you know, that's the thing, as I said, it tends to raise so many questions as to whether they will simply make it a kind of pay to remove the ads type setup, but the service ostensibly stays the same yeah. or whether they'll gate it off in some way. I don't know. Sure. And, and Benji, like on your side, have you seen artists uh, successfully use YouTube advertising, for example, to reach a wider audience with their pledge campaigns? No, I haven't seen them doing. I haven't seen them doing doing advertising. I mean, they, they definitely utilize the video component to it. They'll they'll do a split of like private updates, public updates, etc. Um, but I haven't seen them really kind of. I think most artists that we deal with at the bigger level will have someone in the digital marketing teams doing it. At the small level, they just have no clue that they can even touch that realm. Uh, YouTube haven't made it easy for artists, and I say that knowing you know the head of partners program in, in Los Angeles for YouTube and. When I, I mean, when I went out there, I was like, you know, the opportunity here is huge, you know. Uh, but I, I think that again, it's such a huge company. They're they're really like, you know, they're they're doing. I, I wouldn't say that there's any malicious intent. I think it's really that they're just trying to come to grips with how do you handle this volume and you know, you know, picking like, you know, I mean, you know, I, I've been to the point where I've like I've introduced managers to them, saying, you know, you should, you guys should chat and get your music monetized on YouTube, and that, and that, that sounds odd, but it's true. It's like you know, uh, um, it's it's a it's a massive that uh, there's a massive thought to it. I would welcome the idea to pay to make ads go away for on any service. You know, that's just me. I love I love uh, I, I don't want to strip the company of its earnings by ad blocking them, but at the same time, I, I would uh, you know personally. I will pay to get ads to go away anywhere, any way, shape, or form I can. So. Yeah, absolutely. And Google kind of is grabbing the headlines this week a little bit because uh, there was another story that was interesting because it appears that Google has uh, invested uh, a sum that is rumored to be around $5 million in, uh, in this new music venture by Lior Coin, who is a former Warner Music executive, uh, who is uh, quietly building a high-level team uh, comprising of both management and label talent. So his aim is to create a new kind of music company that sort of has the reach of a major but has has a very much more nimble infrastructure to it. So, of course, the key question is why would Google want to get into the content business? Of course, you know, they've made inroads in the content side, but more on the service side of, side of things. You know, they've invested in Vivo, they've invested in uh, Zagat, they bought Zagat, they've invested in Machinima. Uh, but in a purely content play, does it make any sense whatsoever? Benji, what are your thoughts? Um, so I met with uh, with um, Lior and I met with those guys to kind of see what they're doing. I know that a lot of it's still in stealth mode, so um, I can't really speak to the to the inside of that. But what I will say is that um, 
Uh, I don't, I can't fathom why they would go into the content business other than to say, can they make the Netflix of music? Can they go into that that type of thing? I know, I know that over here in the States in particular, I'm not sure how it is in the UK, but Netflix has really kind of shaken a lot of people. You know, when you've got Kevin Spacey coming on television saying, yeah, we released the entire season of House of Cards all at once and said, people watch it when you want. And what they saw was people were grabbing at it all in one go. And so this, this sort of threading it out. And I, I don't know the, the ins and outs of the YouTube Leo partnership, obviously, um, but I do know that like um, the, uh, the intention there was to build a, a pretty intense company. You know, like, um, so uh, I think YouTube will back winners, obviously, and it's uh, subjective as to whether they are... Uh, they, uh, um, have uh, have back to uh, have back the winner again there. I mean, we just just don't know. Um, but uh, it is an odd move for them, and it's something that I know that a lot of tech people who want to get into the music space they'll often say, you know, the, the, it sounds great on the surface, but holy shit, is it messy when you get inside? <laughs> it is messy, and you know, when you bring in someone from the business world, the tech world, and you say, you know, this is, here's this artist will leave a hundred thousand pounds on the table because the website's the wrong color. That doesn't make sense to a business or a tech person, but it totally does if you've met an artist or a manager and you've been like, you know, you know, but one way is better than the other. Yeah. No, <laughs> it's not because it's the wrong color, you know, so I'm sure you've dealt with that before, Darren, so. <laughs> and uh, Darren, there was somebody actually, I, I can't remember if it was Stuart or who, who it was, but somebody wrote a piece uh, like three or four months ago talking about whether Spotify uh, or other streaming services were going to go the way of Netflix and start producing albums themselves. And I was pretty resistant to the idea, thinking, you know, it doesn't make any sense for them to be producing their own content like that. It's different from the likes of Netflix. You know, music is a very uh, sort of granular thing. You can't produce a series that is going to be liked automatically by millions of people in music. So what, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that, you know, it might you, uh, Google might have those kind of aims? I mean, from where I sat, it, I kind of read it slightly differently. I, I mean, it right. feels like people are reading it more as a um, Google sort of buying into the music industry. When I think perhaps it, it, it to me, it seemed a little bit more like um, what Red Bull did with the sort of Red Bull media, where there may be, you know, it, it may make better sense to Google rather than trying to sponsor select artists or something, for example, to simply own the label that's quite likely to pick up the next Kanye or someone else, you know, which is... Broadly speaking, the kind of rep that, that Leo Cohen tends to uh, tout around, I suppose, you know, in terms of his um, pulling power. So in that sense, it kind of felt to me more like maybe it's just a simple play to land a few artists that would then, you know, toe the, the Google line, which I know sounds a little bit draconian, but you know what I mean? It would mean that things yeah. would debut in a manner that reflects well upon Google and, you know, they would adopt technologies that represent sure. Google's uh, line very well, you know, and, and I think that's the, you know the other thing. As someone pointed out, you know, this is a company that kind of put a billion dollars into Way, so putting five million dollars into into Leo Cohen, while this big number is is pretty small change, I would imagine. Well, for yeah, Google. it's going to be all artists have to wear Google Glass with the little thing in the. <laughs> <laughs> in, in, in a video while holding a Nexus One. <laughs> But it's those things of just, and then whether that might then lead to, yes, you know, album debuts exclusively on Google platform of choice and things like that. But I just think, to me, it felt more like a kind of quicker route to bagging a large uh, star or two than perhaps waiting till they're famous and then trying to negotiate to, uh, to get them to, to, you know, represent you more. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting one. But uh, looking at um, a streaming service where, uh, you know, the business model isn't quite defined yet, uh, the SoundCloud CEO, Alexander Leung, yesterday announced that TechCrunch disrupt in Berlin, yes, uh, that the company has now reached a quarter of a billion uh, monthly uh, unique users uh, onto the platform, uh, which is a 25% increase over uh, July of this year, where they announced uh, the 200 million mark. So it's a pretty fast growth still and they also announced an Instagram integration so they are plugging into the Instagram API to allow users to choose a, a, a photo from their library uh, to use as the artwork for a particular uh, sound so interesting developments of SoundCloud and uh, you know the in integration with Instagram is also interesting because there is of course a Facebook tie up there which is uh, uh, not to be uh, you know discarded and uh, uh, 
it still you know didn't answer the questions of, of what's going to happen with SoundCloud uh, you know in the next uh, six uh, six months to a year. So uh, I guess uh, the interview was a little bit uh, soft on that front because you know they didn't really talk about what what might happen at the company. Uh, do you think that the tie-in of Instagram and the fact that Instagram are thinking about integrate you know are gonna start integrating adverts in into their feed in a sort of way that is uh, compliant to the platform's aesthetic uh, is that going in the direction of uh, perhaps where soundcloud might want to go with their advertising play darren what were your thoughts um to be honest i think it's probably been read slightly too much into it i mean it's <laughs> it's drawing on instagram you know some kind of api just to put images in i, I don't think i think we're ad- just scratching a straws aren't we because we don't really know what's going to happen there <laughs> so. no i mean it, you know it, it just struck me as one of those things where to be honest i kind of thought well that's nice for the average user to be able to do exactly, that yeah um but not much more than that i mean it's not really something that you know i certainly didn't have a bunch of bands banging on my door yesterday asking how they can make use of that um so that side of it bit of a shrug from me really so, <laughs> that's nice but i don't think it's <laughs> in, you know, in all the things that happened this week, that one didn't really feature as a as a talking point. But certainly, yeah, I mean, I think the the PR rolling that they've now got that many users, it's just like I like SoundCloud, and I feel occasionally like I give them a bit of a kicking. But it's sort of this thing at the moment where it's kind of like, well, on the one hand, you don't pay, uh, you know, signed artists and things like that, you know, for for streams. But on the other you're not really doing a great deal to help them beyond giving them a buy button either. And, and granted, there's a discussion there about that you can take your music and embed it on sites and, and all those things. And yes, that's all a valid point. But I suppose what I'm trying to say is that of late, certainly, YouTube, which was the only other comparable platform to me by way of a, you know, a kind of broad appeal, fully portable uh, media player, I suppose, that could work on Facebook or Twitter or your you know, platform of choice, you know, they now have a, a lot more there by way of these merch annotations and things like that, yeah. that kind of allow people to make a, a slightly more compelling, um, you know, pitch. And obviously you can monetize it as well. So in the face of that, you know, as things stand, I have to say, I'm, you know, with, with, the, with the people I work with, I would probably, given the option, steer them more towards YouTube than SoundCloud at this point. Yeah. But at some stage in the future, you know, I think it's just a kind of a when rather than an if on the monetization question because at some point I would have thought we'll, we'll move from the majors asking very nicely if they could fix the monetization thing to the majors starting to get uh, a bit, you know, hefty about it and um, yeah. pushing the point potentially uh, through another legal means if needs be. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. The other thing that was interesting about that was it's like it's a bit like saying SoundCloud now offers Facebook OAuth so that you can pull your Facebook photo in. I mean, what's the difference? It's not really that wasn't really a big thing. I think the number base is huge, but if I were sitting in a major label shoes, I might be thinking to myself, let's wait till it gets to half a million, then then let's uh, then then let's have a chat about it because what they tended to do the major label strategy was is to let these things get really really big so there was a point of no return, and then sit there and say, well. Everyone's invested on one and everyone's invested on the other. Um, I get sent SoundCloud links a lot, and it's a way of getting to it, listening to it, and then kind of moving on. I do love that there's a community aspect to it, but again, I mean, I've I've been sent mixtapes and all kinds of things, and I'm like, wow, that's definitely Sly Stone. Well, that's, you know, you can hear all this kind of stuff going, and you're like, well, that, this is a legal mess that is, that is you know, uh, potentially coming or not, and... Um, uh, you know, but yeah, no, the Instagram thing I think is, is, a, is, as you quite rightly pointed out, Darren, a bit of a, you know, great, cool, and, you know. It's a nice, nice, nice to have. It's a nice little piece. And, and, but the one thing I'll say is, I'm heartbroken that Instagram's going to start putting ads in. And I, I, I remember when they, they did that first one, just the stream of comments, no, no, you know, this. I mean, it's like, it was the last beautiful social network that was just pristine and, I, you know, Please, Instagram, let me pay to to not have a uh, to not have Levi's commercials in my in my stream, please. <laughs> but the writing was on the wall, I guess, uh, as soon as uh, it got. Bought. It's 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 funny, isn't it? I mean, uh, I still find myself amazed that none of these networks will let me just pay some money to make the ads bugger off. I find yeah. it really odd. It's like. I mean, I, it, I suppose it says more about how much, by way of sheer money, they're making out of you. <laughs> 
from the ads than than if you pay. You know? So actually, you know, I was well, when I was in Amsterdam at the, at the music event there, a dance event. I was talking to to a couple of people that run streaming companies, and and they were like, no, you'd actually make more money on if people paid you, you know, two three dollars a month on on keeping the ads away. And I'm like, well, let me, <laughs> let me, well, 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 send me. Uh, you know, I'll give Apple thirty percent of my two. You know, just anything, just make it fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> I totally agree. It's best. You know, I also, yeah, it does speak to a larger point too, and this is one of the things that, that I find interesting. I think that there's a certain type of fan base, uh, 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 there's a certain segment of the super fans of fans also who really do respond negatively to advertising. I just turned on iHeartRadio to listen to my favorite radio station out of Los Angeles, and there was like a you know um, some freaking you know uh, cell phone ad. Uh, over the thing before it was playing. And I'm like, I hate this cell phone company. I hate them. I hate them. I hate them. Why are you in the way of me listening to, you know, just get out of the way. And I think that what we forget is, is that there is a certain type of fan who doesn't care, but they're also not the ones that contribute the largest amount to the music community. But the ones that really do care, really do care. And so if you put the wrong ad or brand in front of that, that you will kill and crush that relationship. And I think that that's what's happening with Instagram. People are in love with it now, and they're about to push things in the way that don't need to be there. I mean, let's face it, like, you know, how much in the global scheme of things is it costing? And to offer a paid version, I think, would really show loyalty to, to brand and to customer and make it a win-win for, for both sides. So, you know, let, let's, let's hope. Let's hope they can hear us. Yeah. You Instagram gods you. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it looks like because of Facebook being involved, their entire business model revolves around advertising. And so it would just seem strange for them to introduce a paid model for Instagram, especially just to preserve the user experience, unless the backlash is so incredible that they have to. But I, I, I don't know, backlashes of this kind, they're always significant, but they're never enough to get a company yeah. to change your course. But we shall see. Uh -oh. And uh, looking at, uh, you know, we talked about SF the SFX IPO last week, actually, uh, but there's more news this week as the company continues its acquisition spree post-IPO. And uh, this week, uh, it got hold of uh, the development house uh, ARK90, uh, of uh, Fame House, and of uh, music startup Tunesy. So, you know, ARK90 Arc, uh, is a development house best known for uh, readability and developing that uh, and a bunch of other uh, apps. And uh, the founder, uh, Richard Ziad, will become the SFX uh, chief product officer. So... I guess a good acquisition there. Uh, you know, the Fame House is an agency with a history of working with uh, uh, big artists like T T Tiesto and DJ Shadow, so they probably have some expertise in the EDM space where SFX wants to work. And Tunesy is quite interesting because it's a it's quite a small startup still. I interviewed the CEO back in uh, April, I think. Uh, uh, I met him at South by Southwest, uh, and uh, they placed their focus on enhancing the relationship between artists and fans and allowing the latter to monetize. Um, well, sorry, the, the former to monetize, the artist to monetize on that relationship. So uh, it's a lot of deals. SFX is really trying to set itself up as a real music powerhouse. And so do you reckon all these moves, the acquisition of a promoter and, uh, uh, you know, it's fearless expansion really after uh, um, getting all this money from the IPO uh, is going to pay off? Is there a space for uh, a massive company that doesn't exist yet, that operates in all these verticals, uh, Benji? Um, I met with SFX guys in, um, and girls in, um, at, at ADE, and um, I, I don't know. It's, there's so many unknowns in that. I know that there's this kind of drive to create something out of Beatport and this sort of, this sort of way in. M my question is, is like, like seeing, seeing the EDM fans, I mean, they're, they're hardcore, but uh, you know, they're also maker fans. They are the ones that, that, that also do credit. And, the barrier to entry to kind of get into the space is not high, but then, then so few rise to the very top. I, I don't know. I mean, I met with Derek. I met with them um, in Toronto a while back as well. And, I, you know, it, it seems like pulling together a whole bunch of things and then making them, you know, that's easy, pulling them together. Making them work as a synchronized unit, that's an incredibly challenging and audacious move. Um, we've also worked with Fame House before, so, like, it's kind of... I don't really know. I, it's it's an odd one. Um, I wish him well, but at the same time, I don't know how you can engage those types of fans. I, I, I want to try it. I want to see if it's possible. And uh, but again, what do you? How do you? How outside the live space and the events? How do you monetize it? And one of the things is, is I, I chatted with someone the other day, 
And I said to them, so, you know, you're into dance music, you know, what, what do you pay on average for a dance track or for a dance, you know, for, for a, a, you know, a mix, what do you pay? And he's categorically, I would never pay for dance music. I would never pay. I'm like, what, why not? He said, because it's free. And I was like, that's an interesting perception, but how does it exist? You know, how does it do that? He's like, I don't know. And I was like, well, <laughs> well that's a problem. Because <laughs> um, he's like, no, no, I, I, he's like, I don't know anyone who would ever pay for it. And I, and I think that the live monetization space is smart and definitely a place to go. But I, I, don't, I don't see a clear route to it. You know, it's an interesting one. Yeah. Darren, any thoughts on uh, building, uh, you know, what we've seen, like, the likes of Yahoo buy a bunch of uh, content companies. And, uh, and also, who was it? Uh, it was uh, the AOL bought a bunch of content companies to, to create, make something out of it. But making it work together, like Benji said, is extremely difficult. Yeah, I mean, in my experience, kind of people like the fact that you have a raft of companies to select yourself and piece together within a campaign or you know whatever you're doing you know that's that's part of the beauty of business is that you can find loads of agencies that you like and you know you might like you know, my company to run the online campaign you might want another one to take care of a, a different aspect but you know i think sometimes when these people put all these things together their natural response is to try and then present it as a sort of united product but that makes selling it in in my experience actually a little bit harder because People don't want to go to one shop to get everything around that. They like to feel that they've picked the best from the, the respective yeah. disciplines, you know. So it feels to me like an odd one. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, it's, it's, it is a curious space to, to work in, the EDM one. It's sort of, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a strange and curious world and uh, one that I'm not, <laughs> massively involved in anymore <laughs> i did work on a tiesto campaign and that was a very enlightening insight as to the way that world moves but it was well no i don't i'm not i'm not trying to be bitchy i just mean no, it, was, no, sure. it, was, it was very sort of you know, large brand plays and you know the album was not you know the album was, was sort of the last on the list really yeah. it was, you know this is a guy playing for thousands of pounds every night you know every night of the week if he wants to so it's a strange world, and I just think, yeah, I'd, I would be surprised if people would want to go to one shop for all of it. And then you get that thing of whether, you, you know, the, the, the respective parts are all as good as one another. Because if one part is amazing and another aspect of the company, frankly, isn't as good or is being beaten by a competitor elsewhere, then it all starts to crumble a bit. So it's a curious route to go, and I worry sometimes that companies like this tend to go in very gung ho, waving a lot of money around, and then they disappear super quick when that money, for whatever reason, dries up. But it tends to be very much boom and bust rather than a sort of slow decline, you know. So it's it's a really interesting thing. It's a really interesting thing because a lot of people. Uh, I remember when, when Pledge was starting to grow, people would say, "Man, you should you, you should you should you know create direct to consumer stores," and I was like great idea but we're not good at that that's not that, that's not the skill set that we're bringing to bear there are people who spent five years just developing d2c stores so why would we do that today i mean you know but like because you've got a big you know and say yeah but it doesn't matter it doesn't make me good at it you know and i think that what happens is you know you would if you were to acquire something along those lines you could then integrate it in in there, but then you got to look at what is your core product. If you're really good at getting a bunch of people into a room to see DJs play, that's something to be really really good at. Does that mean that you're going to be great at online commerce? Does it mean that you're going to be great at you know building apps? Is it you know all those things are re they're skills in and of themselves, right. and then you umbrella them. So it's a bit like you know when you go to the major label. Yeah, but we have in-house press, we have in-house radio, we have in-house digital marketing, and they'll still go out to call you and say we need digital marketing you know like and it's not, not it's not against them it's just that, that like you know a lot of times as you correctly put you want people who's solely dedicated to that skill not just you know it's a bit like when people come for a job you know and they'll say you know I really want to work for pledge okay what are you into I'm into digital marketing but I like booking as well I, I don't know what to do with that <laughs> you know, oh, exactly. you know. <laughs> right yeah how does that help me yeah that's true. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm, I'm going to be keeping an eye on that. And so, so I think it's going to be also influenced by how the shares do, because, uh, of course, it's a public company now. So if, if the shares continue uh, nose diving, then that's going to be a big issue. And 
if they start going up again, then you know there's going to be a lot of perception issues linked to the performance of the shares on Nasdaq, which I think might make it more interesting than maybe other companies that start waving money around and buying things without an agenda just because they have a lot of funding. This is kind of uh, there's an element of accountability that I guess is not is not there for some other players that are on the market. Uh, and uh, moving on to talking about funding, actually, I want to uh, talk quickly about a couple of stories that came up. And uh, first up, uh, a story about Troy Carter uh, on the Panda Daily came up. Uh, he's best known, of course, for being the manager of uh, Lady Gaga with uh, Atom Factory, and he manages a bunch of other people uh, with his team. And uh, uh, you know, he announced uh, a new fund for uh, tech startups of uh, between seventy-five and one hundred million dollars. Uh, uh, Carter is very tech uh, oriented. He's already got his hands, uh, you know. In, in about 50 pies in terms of the different companies, uh, including uh, uh, Spotify, including Songza and Backplane that he created for um, uh, to create Gaga's social network. Uh, and uh, uh, he also invested in a couple of companies that didn't turn out so well. I think he, he had a hand in turn, Turntable FM as well uh, that didn't quite work out. Uh, at least it's not working out at the moment. Uh, so that's interesting because uh, you know he's not just interested in music startups, but of course he's also going to invest in normal startups, but in, in technology, wider technology startups. But in terms of music, uh, uh, it's good to see a manager that puts money towards technology because oftentimes there is that sort of like reticence from even from management uh, uh, to get on board with uh, with new projects, uh, depending on on where you know, especially the ones that are working with massive artists uh, artists like Gaga. So uh, I don't know. Uh, Benji, do you feel like uh, uh, Truck Carter is a, a good person to go and, and do this sort of thing? And will this spur more managers, most importantly, to take a chance on technology companies if somebody like him goes and say uh, goes and says, uh, you know, tech, uh, you know, music, the music industry should embrace technology companies more? I mean, you know, uh, he's one of the smartest guys I've ever kind of met and been in the room with. He's a really, really sharp, sharp um, uh, entrepreneur, and I think that he's that. <laughs> If there was a cynical part of my brain, it would be to say that, like, when you see avenues in music kind of closing and you recognize that tech is nimble and can move quickly, you would clearly move there. But one of the things I also know is that a lot of times if you're, re again, a specialist, if you're really good at management and then you decide, you know what, I can pick winners in tech as well, it's not as easy as that. I give him credit because I think that he really can pull this off. Um, and obviously people will back, you know, people want to back successes. But I think also it's about looking at what's the next gaga, what's the next thing. And if I was a manager, I come from a family of managers, mother, father, stepfather. I know that like, you know, my stepfather was one of the most phenomenal managers. He really, really did stick to that that well, and that's what he does. And um, I think that a lot of times if you're trying to manage an artist and be distracted by the running of a fund, again, two entire complete jobs on their own, it requires a real skill to be able to do that. Um, and, and I don't doubt that he could do it. I mean, he's a really smart guy. Um, I, you know, I remember when he was building like, like backplane for the, for, um, for Gaga, I, I kept wondering like, you know, but couldn't you leverage the existing technologies because of your size to an even greater scale? What are you closing off by creating that interior space? Um, so yeah, I think it remains to be seen. Um, uh, and obviously he's made some very, very smart, smart investments, but it'll become part of a larger portfolio. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, I wonder if he bought SFX. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's you know, my, my interest in it is to see whether a portion of that money is going to go to music startups. Of course, we have no idea what he's going to invest in, but it would be interesting to see if he will commit to music as a, a vertical instead of uh, investing in service companies. If, if, you know, when you raise money like that, if you can just devote right. some parts of it, I mean, it will, it's going to be a lot of people with a lot of opinions. So, <laughs> yeah, right. absolutely. So, uh, Darren, do you feel like uh, on a wider scale, looking at uh, technology startups in music, uh, we're still seeing some exits. You know, there's still interest in purchasing music companies, especially the ones that don't have to deal with rights issues. Uh, so, do you think there's still space for uh, new startups to come in? Uh, you know, I've got a show actually coming on in uh, uh, next week, actually, because uh, I'm uh, going to be away for two weeks. So, uh, there's going to be one show that I recorded with uh, uh, Dave Haynes and uh, Ian Hogarth and uh, a couple of other guys um, uh, talking about the impact of technology in the next five years and can can we see in as much innovation in the next five years and in the past five and so you know do you think that there is a space for uh, more funds to cater for music startups uh, or is it becoming more difficult as we, as we move in time i mean from my experiences you know i know some investors and things like that um it still feels quite fertile to me at the moment yeah. i think well i mean 
so well, let's break this down. I mean, so so you know, Troy Carter, I think, is a, is a a really really interesting guy. I mean, I he always strikes me as somebody who just seems to start with a genuinely blank sheet and doesn't really build on this kind of uh, assumptions that many others would make. You know, and right. I suppose backplane is an interesting one because you know it's the fine example where he probably took one look at Facebook and sort of well, hang on, you know, we've built all of this and Facebook owns it. Well, what's that about? You know, so let's just up sticks and move it over here. And that's a really, you know, it's a simple move in the sense that it, it makes perfect sense to ex when you explain it like that. But it's quite a bold move at the same time to kind of, you know, more or less bin off the, the world's largest social network in favor of creating your own uh, space elsewhere. But I like that because in my experience, certainly way too many people run on assumptions that we have to build on all these things and you're just sat there kind of banging your head on the desk because you started on a on a false hood you know right from the get-go so i like that he thinks that way and i think for that reason he'll be an interesting guy to watch going back to your other point about the sort of music startups generally i have to say my own view is that um you know i see a lot of stuff coming through when people are seeking investment at the moment for various reasons and um they're just all the same. Like, I'm not really seeing... And to me, it feels like there's some massive yawning gaps out there for play, just waiting for people to fill them up. And they might not be very sexy, but they're, but they're there, and they're, they're, you know, they're crying out to be sorted. And I don't know, like, I've, I've become increasingly cynical because I think there's a lot of companies out there. Like, I, I, would, I would suggest probably Shazam is a great case in point, where Shazam, no, they're not like massive PR kind of drum-banging types, unlike... Like Spotify, I definitely kind of like a lot of PR. You know, they're always running PR about something. And Shazam just, the strum is more just like shutting up and getting on with it. But Shazam generate a lot of money for artists and they fill a, a, a very interesting gap there. And they're getting on with it. They're refining the product. They're making very interesting moves. Everything about what they're doing to me just seems like good business. And right. at some point, I'm sure they'll be good and profitable and everything else. And then you get a lot of other ones that get a hell of a lot of hype and coverage. But really, to me, just seem like, you know, that classic one where you'll say they're going, yes, but it's now X years down the line. They've still not actually turned a profit. And, you know, what problem is this really solving? And at the moment, it's a sort of bugbear that music discovery seems to be the thing every, you know, everyone seems to be gravitating towards. And I just don't even know that that's a problem that needs solving personally. Right. Um, and so, yeah, I think it's there's just been this problem lately where everyone followed the guy in front. And the guy in front may have led them down a sort of cul-de-sac, you know, where they're not really going to uh, make any great moves there. But I, I, I'm still adamant there's a, an absolute shitload of, of spaces for people to, to move in. And, and as I said, some of them, frankly, aren't very sexy, but yeah. I think it could still be very, very good things to, to be resolved and would make the music industry a, a much better place. Right. You, it's one of the funniest things because because what you're saying is exactly right down that like there is there are so many areas to exploit the gap and to truly disrupt um, and yet what I get through my inbox all day is is that new new forms of dissemination and discovery is my favorite one. I mean it's it's, it's like you know uh, I remember I remember saying you know talking to someone like yeah but I use Spotify to discover bands. Fantastic. How many of those have you gone to see live or bought a record from? Well, one, so you listen to it every day for around six hours, and out of that six hours, one, so you contributed, what, 15 quid to the entire music industry from, from, from this moment, you know, because you're discovering this new, like, what does that actually mean? And I think that, that funnily enough, the place where I'm the most interested in is in playing on the scarcity. Because, you know, there's a few things that haven't really been disrupted yet. The live space, whether it's putting holograms of dead people into arenas or whatever, I mean, you know, okay, that's, that's one form of it. But, like, you know, um, you know, how do you disrupt the EDM world? How do you disrupt it to make it truly monetizable for everybody along the line? Um, because what, what everyone's focusing on is we, we must get as much music to as many people so they can discover the new shit, right? Right. But then, you know... In the making of the music, in the process of making music, there are huge areas of disruption. You think about it, you know, I think it was like Guitar Center, the biggest guitar, you know, the biggest music shop in America is growing and growing and growing. More and more people are getting into the space. Companies like Gobbler, you know, who, who are trying to figure out this massive file sharing issue that we have within making of music itself. 
So I think you're right. Like I haven't seen much that truly is disrupting because they're all sitting there saying, "I could make a better Spotify. I could make a better iTunes." Like you know, I'm sure, but do we need more of them? <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. You know. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Uh, and um, uh, I wanted to uh, keep talking about funding, and I think uh, we'll actually end the show on, on this particular story just because I want to spin it in an interesting way for both of you guys. So uh, there was an interesting story coming from Ontario, and apparently this, uh, Ontario has approved a $45 million uh, fund to be rolled out over three years for music. This will be divided into four grant programs, including music company development, music industry development, music futures, and live music. And the reason why Ontario is uh, spending so much uh, uh, putting so much into music is because apparently according to the latest stats uh, that were published uh, and this is from a, a billboard article by Karen Bliss uh, uh, you know the, the music production sector generated more than 80% of the total national revenues at $429 million, which seems astounding, really. Uh, so it's an insane percentage. And, uh, you know, this for me, it's a, it's a springboard to talk about uh, funding for the arts. And I know that in the UK, we're making uh, progress. Uh, if the government is starting to recognize the impact of music uh, in the, uh, as an export uh, for the UK and providing more funding as a result. Uh, so I wanted to ask Darren, how do you feel like the funding space is progressing? in the UK and Benji of course uh, Pledge provides a way for musicians to uh, fund the recording of their albums and, and a bunch of other things and uh, are there any programs in the US that allow uh, artists to perhaps complement what they can make on Pledge uh, with other types of funding like uh, it was discussed a couple of weeks ago at a, uh, a funding event here in London um, or do they have to rely exclusively on what they can make uh, commercially essentially from a Pledge campaign uh, so I guess uh, Darren first I mean, I've, yeah, I think it's it's been interesting. Like, you know, well, you and I were both in Ireland for the, the hardworking class heroes thing last right. month, or earlier this month, actually. Damn, time flies. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, over there, I think there is more. I get the feeling there's more money put aside to to supporting the, you know, the musicians out there and things like that. And I, I yeah, I, I like it. I think it's it's good to see. I mean, there are funds in the UK, and there's you know there are arts funded bodies like generator in the northeast that are doing really really good things by way of um you know i, I love the thing that generator did called mapped out where they basically picked off a load of uh, secondary towns i suppose you call them and linked them with promoters from primary towns you know to try and educate them on how best to uh, run events and market themselves and you know to try and open up these spaces so that a band could go and play in uh, you know, Hull or Sunderland or, you know, any of these other cities where actually when you go and you look, there's a whole bunch of people, you know, bloody dying to see a band live in their area that isn't just another covers artist or whatever, you know. So I, I think there are people out there doing some very good things, but I think more funding in that area would be lovely to see because I think the sad thing, you know, is that the, uh, you know, the commercial intent of, of any commercial organization is is such that they tend to do these things with you know uh, a mandate hanging over them whereas government funded initiatives particularly i think can be uh much more just artistic by way of you know there's not an expected return on it and things like that and i mean it was, it was an interesting point actually yesterday or, uh, no, no earlier today sorry i'm losing my track on time um was chatting with somebody about the virgin disruptors event that went on the other day which it was interesting, a lot of people there saying a lot of very interesting things. Um, but uh, the, this person was sort of bemoaning the fact that what they, you know, they only ever talked about technology. So you had a bunch of artists in the room and all they were talking about was tech. Um, and his point of comparison was saying that, you know, Grayson Perry recently did the, the lectures thing on Radio 4 and Grayson Perry was talking much more about just art and the nature of art and the way in which art has changed and, you know, making points like the fact that these days kids aren't, you know, their cultural or their subcultural kind of standpoint isn't as defined by things like music anymore. You know, it's a much broader element to it and things like that. But what this guy was basically saying was, you know, the it, it was interesting that the Virgin event was so kind of tech-led and all about tech and tech companies and wasn't about art and the nature of art and just the cultural element itself. And, uh, yeah, I think that's an area where at the moment it feels like it would be good just to get more focus on art without the overarching elements of the tech company specter and, you know, revenue and advertising and all of these things, you know, because at the end of the day, I actually think there's people out there doing some formidable stuff and it 
tends to get ignored for the wrong reasons, and that's wrong. You know, and, and so more funding in these areas to allow those kinds of things to bubble up, I think isn't just a case of giving these people a platform. It's giving a chance to redress a sort of balance here on the fact that you know commercial radio will play commercial music. So non-commercial music tends to get no standing at all. But where you have arts funded things, you know, in London we've got things like Resonance FM, you know, which is arts council funded that just plays the strangest fucking music day and night. And I love that it's there, even though 50% of the output I can't bear, because it needs to be there. It yeah, absolutely yeah. needs to be there. And it's not there to please me. It's there to do what the hell it wants. And I yeah, love yeah. that by being there and standing in that place, it's a massively inspirational spot. Yeah. You know, and, and I think if you could have more of those, frankly, anywhere in the world, we would all be the better for it, because it redresses the balance. And that's really, yeah. we need that quite badly at this point, I think. Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, I spent a lot of time in Canada. I just got back from Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm heading to Mo I'm from Montreal. And so I spent a lot of time in and around the Canadian music industry. And a really interesting thing happens over there. There's 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 an amazing upside, which means that artists of um, any size have the same shot at getting grant funding, and they can then go in and make an album, but with a really good producer. They can they, they utilize it in all sectors of the industry, even down to independent labels can get government funding from it. And so you're right, it does put out the stranger stuff because it's culturally relevant. I mean, uh, you know, in Australia as well, you've got this thing where they culturally keep alive Aboriginal music. They, they, they go into all areas of it. And, it, and you know, it's, it's like, it's not for everybody, but it's for somebody. And that's relevant as an art form because, you know, you know, late Beethoven sounded like noise to people. And he was able to do it because it was culturally relevant to the time. And sometimes it takes a long time for art to be recognized for what it is, I agree. I think that the, that the other side to that is... It means that that um, you they are forced to disseminate a lot of stuff if there's a great grant proposal. Right. So if it's written well, it will get made, and that's a, that's that, that's a, another question of as to how. And again, you know, I would much rather people were making art than making weapons. So that's a good thing. <laughs> Let's keep it there. In America, there's almost no help for this type of thing. Right. That's and that's I mean. one of the reasons that people are, are, are swinging so hard behind tech is because they see it as this great hope of um, getting it out there. The one thing I'll say to Darren, and this really does occur to me, that, that the, the greatest disruption in technology and music for me has been in the fact that it's not just about creating the art, it's about how the art is created. And one of the things that I always say to, to artists on, you know, who are working with us is, when you're being an artist, you're really interesting to a lot of people. So when you see someone live, they are performing their art live. That is the ultimate moment. And what the industry has done for so many years is hide the creation of the art. And now what's happening is social networks are uncovering that. And a lot of times it's messy, but a lot of times it's incredible. So to me, one of the wide open frontiers, the reason I built Pledge was to, 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 to expose that piece of it, which is that... Uh, an artist, when they're in the studio, urgent, sweaty, freaking out, doing it, is a lot more interesting than when they're holding up their glossy CD, you know, from their, their glossy 1980s technology saying, buy my shit. Because that's the truth of it, is, is that that's, that's what it is. And um, what I would say to the Canadian artists, that, that we work with the Australian artists, is, is you guys have a leg up that does not exist in most other countries. Use it. So if you've got funding to go to South by, if you've got funding to work with an incredible producer, don't stop there. Take it all the way out. And the irony is that all of those Canadian artists and Australian artists who have that government funding all want to leave. They all want to go and they want to break in America. They want to break in, in, in England. They want to break in, in those places. And I think that one of the biggest things that the English music industry left on the table was if they were heavily invested in that music industry that is massive in export, I think that they will see huge cultural returns coming back. But there is that, that still that big bear, which is that everyone wants to make it in, in England and then bring it over to America. And America's just kind of, you know, it's, we have, I mean, hun, you know, I think what CD Babe, uh, you know, TuneCore did 90,000 releases last year. And I think CD Babe was about 70 or 80,000. I mean, huge numbers of releases. And you're like, that's without government funding. Imagine if all of a sudden government starts pushing in, you know, I think it's great, but but at the same time, it's it's sort of um, 
you know, I don't think that, that artists necessarily need more money. I think that they need uh, roots to monetize themselves. I think that's really a, a huge part. And they need to learn to cultivate fan bases. Right. And a lot of times, if you shove money at that, it, 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 it can bypass the fan part and go straight to, well, it should be on radio. And then you've got, you know, does the radio station have to play a certain amount of, of government-funded music? Because... You know, the government's funding 90% of the music out there. So it, it, it'll, it'll be a slippery balance. But either way, I think more music being made is not going to be a problem. And then, you know, we can all discover it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, guys, I think that's uh, what we got to pretty much at the end of the show. It was a real pleasure having you on. And uh, I want to ask you if there's anything uh, you want to plug. Uh, Benji, I I'm not sure if there's anything on, on the pledge uh, side. I've just had a press release of a partnership between you and Moshkam, for example. I don't know if you want to talk about that or talk about whatever you want. I don't want to plug anything. I want to say thanks for listening and thanks for getting me up in the morning and, and uh, getting me through the coffee. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> thanks uh, so much. My hockey team, the New York Rangers, they won last night. There, I'll go thanks. with that. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Darren, anything you're in? No, not really. I mean, from my side, there's probably a million things I should plug and someone will be disgruntled. So I'm just going to... <laughs> I'm, not, I'm just gonna book, actually. I've been reading this book at the moment called "Social Media Is Bullshit," and, uh, and I, I, I strongly recommend reading it. Uh, it, it. It did at points made me strongly reflect on what I do for a living. Uh, but it's, it's a really good read. It's sort of one of those where I think everyone that works in marketing, uh, full stop, but particularly music, should read it. So uh, go and check it out if you're uh, listening or watching because. It's a real eye opener, and I think it's one of those uh, where you see things that you can't really unsee. And then, subsequent to that, if you're sat in meetings and everyone talks about social media metrics, you have to chew your fist and not explode <laughs> in, in massive yeah. rage at how pointless these things are. <laughs> My absolute favorite quote was social media is like high school sex. Everyone talks about it, but no one does it. <laughs> nice. Perfect way to end. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, thanks so much for listening to the show. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be away for the next couple of weeks. Uh, but I've got three shows lined up. Uh, one of the main shows that's going to come out next week and two of the one-to-one -one shows with uh, two great companies. Uh, uh, I've got uh, Moshcam and uh, Radar Music Videos uh, lined up for the one-to-one. -one. And I've got an interesting panel, as I mentioned, that is going to go on the main show next week. I had this uh, great grand vision of doing... a. Uh, uh, show on independent labels and do a bunch of interviews and uh, figure out what they are up to, how they're developing, especially younger labels. But I hadn't figured out how impossible it was to actually get people from independent labels on a show. <laughs> so <laughs> after about three or four weeks of trying, uh, I kind of gave up. So I think uh, in that second week, there isn't going to be a DMT show. It's the first uh, skip in nine months, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, uh, you know, you can look at the back catalog and I'm sure you'll find something interesting. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week and until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.